welcome back to Supreme Fuzzler. I am in a new room, and I'm hoping that this will be easier to work with. And let's get to it, though. We're doing episode 8 of season 4. Wow. Season 2 of Venture Brothers. It is Fallen Arches. Beautiful episode. I'm just going to say it. Dr. Orpheus is going to have a major part in this episode. But let's get to it, where because it just starts with a... Guild of the Calamitous Intent video with Watch and Ward, our friendly guys from the guild, being like, Hello, Dr. Orpheus and team. He covers his mouth and while he says it, it's so awesome. Like, you have been approved for an arch. And they kind of go off about how, why the guild is the best choice for them. They go off on their stats. Um, since 1910, the guild has been bringing professional menace. They show a whole stats bar, which actually reveals... Some later on, you um, villain rivals basically the Peril Partnership and the Fraternity of Torment, as well as unlicensed villains. But showing that the guild has it, what seems to be a, 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 over half, so like 60, maybe even two thirds percentage of the entire um, villainy world in their control, which is pretty damn brutal. Um, then they basically explain well, Ward is like, why wouldn't. Dr. Orpheus and team not just go with some other villain partnership, though. Why just go us even with this these stats? Will you ever learn? Then they show a video, which has a bunch of characters that will are reoccurring guild of Calamitous Intent villain characters. That And the video basically explains what could happen if you don't work with the guild. If you work with, like, particularly unlicensed villains... But also other villains, I'm assuming other villain partnerships just don't have as good of treaties. Because that's one of the things. So the first thing is disregard for treaties. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then the next thing in is um, improperly matched animosity. Which basically means unequal aggression. Which is something we'll come back up later in the series. But it basically shows a huge hero next to a really tiny villain trying to kick him. And it's basically showing how, you know, like, some people just don't equal in their power levels. And if you have a villain who's just weak in matching, it's going to be really boring and not really eventful for the hero. This is, in my opinion, this is more effective for the hero side than the villain side. Because if a villain has a weak hero, then they can do whatever they're trying to do easier. Unless that's Arch the Hero specifically. But if a hero has a weak villain, then it really takes all the fun out of their funness. Because really, you just, you know, you show up, kick their ass in one blow, and then it's done. And then, likely, after three, four, you know, a dozen times, maybe, this little villain will probably stop, and then, you know, you got nothing. So it's an interesting thing. <clears throat> the third thing is inappropriate behavior, which they show this, like, uh, 1920s, I guess? I don't know why. Not 1920s, sorry. 1700s type looking motherfucker. And who has got a weird, like, makeup face, and takes off his um, shirt and to show his nipples and kisses the guy who he's got tied up. Basically showing that some... It's interesting in what the guild is implying. That they don't do these kind of things, basically. Their people will avoid breaking the... going across the line and doing these types of uh, stuff to their villainy. Then it shows Dr. Orpheus asking Triana who delivered this, which she's like, it's someone in goggles. And then Orpheus is like, wait, 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 what's going on here? And the fucking thing shows ba a little message basically being like, we're going to be interviewing you today. And he's like, today? 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 And then, whoosh, and then like teleports out of there just super fast. It's really awesome. And then goes to, after the intro, Rusty and the Venture family. Rusty is introducing the family to his walking eye. He's basically asking the Venture family to give him ideas of what the eye is for. Because it's, from what it sounds, like a new invention. Rock, Brock, wow, Rock, Brock suggests it can be used for reconnaissance. And then fucking Dean is like, it could have a laser on it. And then Hank goes off about how a monkey can come out of his from behind. And Rusty's like, mm, no. And then Hank is like, well, what does it do? And he's like, well, it's a walking eye. It does for reconnaissance, has laser mounted weaponry and monkey proof shielding. Like, you got that from us? No, I didn't. It's a walking eye, Hank. We have, we've always been like this. Then there's like a alarm goes off and they're like, what the hell's going on outside? And Hank and Dean are freaking out about what's going on inside. Rusty's like, holy crap. And then Brock's like, oh my God, there's a breach in the west door. And he's like, are you gonna do anything? 
And Brock's like, yeah, I'm going to open the east gate. And then helicopters show up, and Brock's like, they're landing in my herb garden. I got to go check that out. Ah, uh, so fun and such an interesting... This episode really delves deep into the guild, actually. That's even talked about in the book I have about how a lot of characters that are in the background and stuff, this is where we got to write a more expansive background for certain people and have them utilize. It's really fun. And it goes to Jefferson Twilight, who is ah, a Blackula hunter, a black vampire hunter, a hunter of the vampires who are black. He fucking, he gets this guy, this, this particular vampire who's basically like, I will turn you into a vampire. I don't know how the, it feels anymore, but I bet it'll be great. And he fucking, the guy, Jefferson Twilight gets him in a lock where he got his teeth and he's like, I'm going to rip out these teeth, basically. And it's like, oh, don't do it. And then a, the other vampire, which, because there was two, was like going to get him, but then boom, he gets blasted by a laser and it's Orpheus. And fucking or Jefferson's like, alright, and then whips this dude's teeth out, and then cuts his head off really quick, and he's like, dude, I haven't seen you in years, and then you just, and he actually stutters and everything, he's like, I saved my stitch situation, and Orpheus basically explains, like, that's just a coincidence, I'm here to discuss that we actually have a team and everything, Jefferson's like, well, crap, man, I thought you got all, like, a dad and everything, and Orpheus explains that he's just like, my daughter's, you know, getting a driver's license and how everything's kind of, you know, more chill for me these days. And he's, and Jefferson Twilight points out like, no, 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 man, you have a secret identity. That's movie cool. And by the way, this whole time, Orpheus keeps zapping the guy behind freaking Jefferson and finally he's like, why won't he die? He's like, you got to take his head off because I'm assuming because it's a vampire and that's like the, apparently the plot line in this series. But I get to get the teeth. Because he has a necklace of teeth that I forgot to mention. He's like, I need him for my teeth necklace. When he, when the other guy's like, don't take my teeth. <laughs> ah, Jefferson's a fun character. Then it goes to 21, who is doing like what looks like arts and crafts. And then he gets scared by 24, who's like, oh my god. And like, oh, I totally scared you. And he's like, I was about to cut you with these scissors. Oh, I was so scared of that. And he's like, what are you doing? And 21's like, I am making us licenses. And he shows off an arching license. 24 is like you're 6'2 and 130 pounds like no one reads it they just flash it <laughs> uh lying on your license and 24 goes off about how like no we shouldn't try to do that i don't think we're capable of doing this 21's like you think we can't do better than the monarch and 24 points out yes you know how ruthless the monarch actually is so fucking funny but so true the monarch is a vicious Master villain, so cool, Bruh! <laughs> so cool. It then cuts to the monarch, who is like, being like, I know you want my body, so but now say it. And he has this girl who, in a very womanly voice, is like, I want my king butterfly, and he's like, No, 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 deeper. I want mine, no deeper, green butter, deeper, de way deeper. Demanding that she just talks in a deeper voice because you know that's his thing. That's what he's into. He wants Doctor Girlfriend. He actually has her dressed up as Doctor Girlfriend. As a matter of fact, I forgot that part, but totally is. It's fucking funny and really intense. Then it goes to Venture Family and the hall that that the comp Venture Compounds front hall, which the Watch and Ward comment how the Treaty of Tolerance was signed here, and they basically go off about how Jonas Seniors how they got into the business and. They all and all how much they love him and how they think he's just one of them of the best heroes ever. And Rusty is like, "Well, get away from my lab because I have a lot of important stuff going on in there." And they giggle and are basically making fun of him because they don't never think Rusty is actually worth anything. Which I would say, no, he's got fucking clones now, so we know that. So he's actually obviously a capable scientist, and he just doesn't want to utilize that particular invention it's freaking why i'm always like dude and actuality rusty brilliant scientist at least in some way rusty asks where orpheus is which watch him water like there he's gathering the, his team rusty giggles himself kind of like <laughs> team hey what a wuss he had to get a team and ward like does the whole <clears throat> jealous which he might actually be rusty but he shouldn't be, because even though he got a t technical team, Rusty is a team. Yeah, Rusty's directly arched on his own, but technically it's team venture. I don't know what Rusty's all kind of weird about. 
But of course, you gotta be jealous of someone because he always thinks that he's inferior because that's the biggest thing about Rusty, his huge complex of inferiority that his father gave him. Then it goes to Orpheus recruiting his third recruit, which is the Alchemist, a voice by Dana Snyder. Um, if you've ever seen Aqua Teen Hunger Force, it's Master Shake, fucking super funny voice, amazing. He really does justice of the character. It talks about in um, J Jackson Publica, which I realize public, by the way. I've been realizing I've been saying his name completely wrong. It's Jackson Public, which instead of Jason, I'm sorry, and Doc Hammer. They talk about how they believe he they did really well, and he and Dana being brought a really great um, voice that truly fit the Alchemist really well. The Alchemist, they do, it's funny, an interesting joke where Jefferson's like, "You still and." Alchemist is like, no, 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 I grew out of it. Just a phase. But no, yes, of course, which he's referring to the fact that he's gay. He he is a full gay man. Which, is in, I like how they do this joke way better than they did it in the last episode, literally. Because it's a way more, um, you know... Basically, I, why would I grow out of that type of joke? Like, it's not like that kind of situation. Because that's not how it works, of course. You know, it's it's that thing that Venture Brothers really gets better at as it progresses, and Alchemist is one of the best characters at doing it. So, he they talk about or how they want him to create their team and how they've been approved for a new arching, and they ask him what he's been doing, and Alchemist is like, I've been looking for the cure for AIDS. I'm like, how noble! Now I feel like I shouldn't take you. No, 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 it will give me great publicity and enough money to help me do this. Everyone loves that hero crap. <laughs> they even did, then do a little talk about how, like, Alchemist has gotten pudgier because he is kind of like a somewhat balding, kind of little bit of a pudge on his him type of character guy. And Orpheus explains, like, well, it's hilarious. Fucking, um, or Jefferson Twilight's like, just wear black, man. And then Orpheus is like, no, 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 wear this robe. It leads the eye down or whatever the, I don't know what he calls it, but basically his type of clothing. Because it leaves the eye down. It doesn't make you look too big. It makes them look at your legs, I guess, is what he's trying to say. Rusty goes in. Well, we cut to Rusty going into the bedroom and being like, Hank, go clean yourself up. Which Hank's like, you told us not to leave the room. And he's like, go get your pimples clean so you don't look like Edward and James Allman. Do you want to look like that and get like a girl in a car crash, man? And freaking, freaking Hank out. So he fall, runs out to go get his face clean. He then goes to Dean and is like, so, Orpheus has asked me to watch his daughter, which I don't care to do. So I need you to help me and take care of that. And Dean's like, what do we have to do? We have to do, we have to get costumes. Oh my God. And like, I thought you would take right back like this. And like stops Dean from running. I have to tell you something that people like you have known since they were like 13. <laughs> and he essentially tells him the birds and the bees. It shows him, like, doing a bunch of humping things and, like, getting gra doing it and grabbing the boobs in motion, essentially, with, um, Dean. And then he does a whole, uh, and there she is, right there, just writhing on the hood of the car. What was David Coverdale to do? And Dean's like, break up white noise? That's white snake, Dean. And yes. And Rusty's like, yes, we laid the blame, me, uh, me and Brock laid the blame on Tawny's scrawny shoulders. Uh, I'm glad we had this talk. And he just fucking leaves Dean, I guess, apparently believing he told him how the birds and the bees work. Which, by the way, apparently that whole scene he talks about is apparently about the 1987 video, Here I Go Again, by Whitesnake. Although I don't know everything about that because that was a little before my time. Um, and then it goes to... 21 and 24, and 21 reveals some jetpacks, which he, 24 is like, I got are those what I think they are? Only if you think those are jetpacks, because those are jetpacks. And 24 asks where he got them, where 21's like, I stole them from Sergeant Hatred, and 24 is like, what the hell, man? Like, what? And 21, of course, is like, what's wrong, bro? Like, dude, we don't steal jetpacks. Come on. It's so funny and awesome, but true. Like, whoa, bro, come calm down. And then they go off about how they have he has leather costumes, 21 does, and trying to convince 24 to join them. And basically 24 finally agrees to it, and he's like, well, one day we'll just swoop in with a full three-day beard into some girl's house, 
and totally beat up the hero and be like, and then get to that girl and start kissing her. And 21's like, then you'll be having sex, man. Sex. Sex. So funny. Then it goes to Monarch, who is like, the money's on the counter. You find it's generous enough. And she's like, thanks, sugar. The girl is like, well, should, can you tell me where to go? Just to our main street? Now listen to me and listen well. We, this place has many traps and perils. Uh, uh, just to 9th Street? Like, the now don't you bear me, Theseus, for I'm the mighty Minotaur. And he reveals a fucking Minotaur tattoo. That just is so beautiful and cool looking, in my opinion. And it's such a funny part to reveal it. And the girl's so obviously freaked out because of who wouldn't be. And then Mara goes off about how the cocoon has witnessed your sins and now demands punishment. The cocoon punishes the wicked. The cocoon rewards the righteous. And she's like, oh my god, do it. And then the bed opens up like, how much do you want to live? That's so fun. Then we go back to the Venture Compound. We were doing an arching auditions, it seems. In the line, you see a lot of fun characters that will be utilized piece by piece as the series progresses. All of these are villains and Guild of Calamitous Intent members, majority of them. I think all of them are, basically, in reality. And it starts with the intangible Fancy, who introduces himself to Torrid, who is a fire guy. He kind of sets the intangible Fancy's hand on fire, but it's he, the Fancy is like a ghost guy. And so Fancy's like, fire thing. Lots of themes and costumes for the fire thing. Me, like, I can't even wear costumes. Torrid inquires, do you have, um, genitals? No, not anymore. And Torrid's flaming head just kind of flares up real quick. It's kind of funny. And then he's like, hey, is that Venture co Compound? Yes, I think so. Say my place in the queue. There's something I must do. Something Torrid. He's a good character. I actually really do like Torrid. I think he's a very well-designed character and a fun little fire-looking guy. The book I have here says he's kind of based off of Dormammu and, um, and Dead Man, although I don't know who that is as much as I know Dormammu thanks to this Marvel Cinematic Universe. Thank you. I'm a fortunate comic book reader. I read manga. Which I know is Japanese comics, but whatever. <laughs> Then we go back to the auditions, which actually has, we're, we're not actually at the auditions, rather. The Order of the Triad, which by the way is the name of this group between Orpheus, Jefferson Twilight, and the Alchemist, is uh, uh, interviewing their possible candidates. This first one's a scuba looking guy who, <laughs> Alchemist is like, is that a, your head or a flipper on your head? I don't know what you are. And Basically, they tell him next, because he's obviously not going to be a candidate who's going to be chosen. Then it goes to Hank, who's messing with some kind of gel or lotion, and he's like, I gotta get the benzo peroxide. Oh, that's right, he's cleaning his face, because Rusty told him to. That makes sense, actually, and wow, interesting, it's kind of funny. Hank runs into the um, toilet, the bathroom, and freaking, apparently Torrid had wanted to go on the crapper, that's why he had to go in here. And he's like, don't knock or anything, and then he tries to grab some um, toilet paper, but he sets it on fire because he's a fire guy, and he's like, oh crap, and then I'm assuming he teleports out using fire is what it is, because it kind of like does a kind of thing like that, and Hank's like, oh my god, what, you died in here, oh Jesus. <laughs> then it goes to 21 and 24 again, which they have really shitty looking costumes, just horrible, like there's a bucket on 24's head, and there's a glove or something on 21's head, they, 24 is like, I thought you said you had leather costumes. They have leather padding on them, man. And look, we have jetpacks. And 24 is like, well, you can only have so long a jetpack on you before you, you have to use it. And, but 21 can't use it because he's unfortunately an overweight man. It's kind of funny. But it's just what happens to him and he can't do it. And 24 uh, points out as he flies away, my shoes are on fire. My shoes are on fire. <laughs> Goes back to the interviews, which <laughs> this guy is apparently a this fish dude looking lizard guy is talking to Black to Jefferson Twilight, and he's like, "Yes, I only hunt Blackulas. Like, so you only hunt African American vampires? No, I actually hunt Blackulas in Britain too. They don't have African Americans in Britain. Huh? That's true. 
And it's like, yeah, motherfucker. He's like, I look, I only hunt black vampires. I don't know the PC term for that. And I mean, yeah, Jefferson Twilight makes his fair points. It's like that's just how it is. And assumably, like one, oh, that's right. Orpheus is like, is that a mask? And Alchemist is like, oh, I was thinking that too. Honestly, weird. And then it cuts away to Dean, who is putting on what is a play, which apparently is Windermere's Fan, which is a play from the 1890s, and like about an affair or some, something like that. I looked it up, but I can't remember all the details. Um, and Hank is, he, Dean's like, you could enter the Duchess of Agatha after he's he's playing with it with Dan, Brock, and Brock is doing one, uh, reading the lines from a book. And then at a point, there's basically a, Q to come in and he's like where's the Duchess of Agatha and Hank's like you have to come into this bathroom and smells like something died man you just gotta get in here <laughs> and Brock's like that's it I'm done Triana you want to do this huh oh, I'm not gonna do that no as Triana is probably is just reading and you know you don't need to entertain her she's fucking a teenager or whatever or you should go watch a movie oh my god Dean's so bad at this nah poor kid Goes back to the Order of the Triad, which is taking on this guy who they're calling Chris, but he's like, I'm Curse. My name is Curse. And they're like, we're going to give him the old Rochambeau. What does a general from the Amer African the American Revolution have to do with this? American? It sounds like French. Yes, from the Franco-American forces, because Orpheus is just a freaking know-it-all, obviously. It's just how it is. Alchemist points out, rock, paper, scissors, I thought? What? And then Curse goes on the attack. But then freaking Orpheus takes away his legs. Alchemist uses magic, which to take away his arms. And then freaking uh, Jefferson just boom takes his sword to his throat. It was like that was movie badass, super cool. And it really was a really dope display of their powers and how all of them are so cool. Oh my god. Then it goes to the prostitute running down the hall from <laughs> freaking uh, Monarch and. She runs to a door and Monarch is over is over the intercom being like, maybe that will have candy and a full supply of puppies. And then she opens the door and he's like, or the polar bear from Lost. And it's a polar bear. And it's like, what the fucking what? What the hell? God, it's such a weird twist. It was so funny though. Watch the series, by the way. I haven't said that yet, but please watch the series. Be like, support Venture Brothers. I can't wait for that final movie. And I hope it's going to be good. Well, I know it's going to be good, but I hope it's going to wrap up enough, or if it gets like, good enough to be able to, you know, traction the next season. Just, oh my god. I love this series. Like, it is definitely, it's why I did this one before, like, even Futurama or um, Metalocalypse. While they're both are amazing series that I want to do and discuss, but this is the one that's just way above those. I'm just, not above them. Actually, yes, a little bit above them. Futurama's kind of tied, I would say. But it's just amazing shows. They're just such a good show that just has fucking such a brilliant story. Anyways, we go to Rusty, who's trying to go take out the rocking eye to the, uh, into the yard. Brock, who's in a tuxedo, is like, you probably shouldn't do that. I don't know if that's a good idea. And Rusty's like, you just said that no one would care, huh? That you said that everyone didn't care about the walking eye. Like, I didn't mean for you to take it out, dude, and just wave your dick around, basically. And he, Rusty asks why he's in a tuxedo, and he's like, he staged Windermere's fan, Dean said, it was your idea? No, 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 I tried to teach him the birds and the bees. And Brock said, how did that go? He staged Windermere's fan. <laughs> it's so true, what the fuck? Dean is so, like, naive, and especially early seasons, Dean. He is just so out of touch, and that's why I love his growth. He is one of my favorite characters because of that. But early him is so hard to deal with sometimes, because why, boy? Why are you being so dumb? Then it cuts over to Dean and Hank, who Dean has gone into the bathroom and is like, you should see a doctor for how bad this smells. Jesus, Hank. Oh my god. And Hank's like, we have a mystery on our foot, bro. Don't even need to have time for that, honestly. <laughs> so true. We go then to Rusty, who's cleaning his walking eye out in the field in front of all these villains. Um, and he's doing it all seductively and all like sexily, and there's like sexy, seductive music, you know, that old school style. And you see a few villains that we'll see in the, later in the future. One I want to particularly point out, too, at least Sergeant Hatred, who will be a major character later, I will just spoil. 
and Kim Jong Il, I think, like the older version back in 2006 when this was made, because, which by the way, I know this is 2006 because the arching license in 21 had says the two, issue 2006, by the way. Um, it is really fun and an interesting little sequence that Rusty, Dr. Venture is basically being like, you can get much better from me, boys, essentially. <laughs> Triana it points out that they should just retrace their steps, and Dean's like, okay, okay. Well, and Hank points out, like, all right, I was coming through the bathroom door, and I think someone was on the toilet. So Triana gets on the toilet, and as Hank pretends to get in, come into the bathroom, she gets vaporized, maybe. Fire just goes and just, like, and fucking, wow, oh my god. She's gone. Then it goes to Monarch, who is showering off his tattoo, which in the show it's not really clear because it's hard to animate. But in my book, it talks about how the scene is supposed to show the Monarch losing the tattoo. It's supposed to be being washed off as shown as a non permanent, actually, Sharpie tattoo is what they specifically say. Because, but it was hard to animate that, and so that was never really portrayed to the audience. And so there was a lot of people who thought he had a Minotaur tattoo for the rest of the series. Even I did for a long time until I read this to be confirmed. I really like this book because it gives me a lot of like information about certain things that I wasn't sure about 100%. And these are the literal writers of Venture Brothers so they can answer those questions. Super fun. Then it goes back to the auditions of the Order of the Triad. Orpheus is looking at this resume saying it's really impressive, and I, but I think I might know you. And then it shows Dr. Girlfriend who is Lady Au Pair and trying to use her murderous moppets and working to get a new solo job. An interesting little showing of what Dr. Girlfriend's doing, kind of showing that she's breaking away from Phantom Limb, obviously, because she's trying to go solo. Um, the voice turns off the boys, of course, the Order of the Triad, they're like, do you smoke or eat cigarettes? And she's like, God, I just, whatever, I'm leaving. Does anyone want to mop it? Which, the moppets are an interesting character too, because in the book, they talk about how they were just a throwaway gag character that they th drew in in order to have characters supporting Dr. Girlfriend in this little bit that they are doing here, which is fun because they become very interesting characters as the episodes progress and the series progresses. Hank, then, we go back to Hank, who is giving a list of clues of what um, he thinks is happening, basically, of what happened, basically. Like, fire and the smell of what his vomit or, or diarrhea. And essentially, Dean finally kind of susses out a certain something, apparently. I don't know how he figures this out, but he figures it out by looking at the mirror. And so Hank goes to the shower. He, t he tells him to turn on the shower, so Hank goes and does that. As he does that, it shows in the shower is Torrid. So as he turns on the shower, it, like, does that whole thing with fire when, you know, you turn on fucking water on it and it turns into steam really fast. So steam goes everywhere and really fast, revealing on the um, mirror that Triana has written there that I am in the Torrid Zone. We have to tell her feather, fucking Hank says. We have to find her feather. And it's so stupid. They're like, it's obviously her, though. Like, how do you know? She dotted her um, eye with a circle. Girls totally do that. Hank, even though you are right that that is Triana, I don't know if your assessment of that is correct 100%. But interesting little tidbit. And then it goes to 21 and 24 again. 24 is going like, I don't, I don't, we're not going to be Jet Boy and Jet Girl. I don't care if I get to be Jet Boy. Oh man, it's like an indie song though. It would be a lot of cred for us. The Damned do a cover of it. And 24 points out, quite rightfully, then we should be the Damned. That's a way cooler name. Like, dude, Jet Boy and Jet Girl, come on. <laughs> then it goes back to the Order of the Triad, which is an audition of Torrid. And it's like, do you want to sit down? I shall stand. St uh, sitting is for the weak and feeble. And then Alchemist kind of stands right up. And then Jefferson's like, I like him. He's got ants, you know, fire ants. And Alchemist is going off about like, what? I, I, I need to stand. I got back pain, you know. And Orpheus is like, all right, all right. Well, what kind of menace can you offer us? And Torrid's like, I kidnapped your daughter. You kidnapped my pumpkin. So true. Like, such a savage introduction. And Orpheus jumps at him, and freaking Alchemist is like, we have a winner. And, and Jefferson's like, he's not even a Blackula. So funny and true. And God, it's got a winner for the arch enemy, though. Ah, so true. 
Then it goes to the walking eye being attacked outside. Massive amounts of all the villains are all over it. And Rusty is eating a sandwich being like, that. they figured out when they needed a real hero. So they went after the true prize. And Brock's like, all right, man, um, you want me to go get them off of it? And Rusty's like, no, 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 you don't have to. And like, it doesn't really work that well, honestly. <laughs> but the government will start giving me calls after they hear about this is incident to give some orders. <laughs> I mean, like, damn, what a marketing scheme. And then Brock's like, all right, I'm going to go out there and kill and some people because I want to. And freaking Bro Rusty's like, don't you want to chain? No, 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 no. I love killing in a tux. It makes me feel like James Bond. And it does the music from the fucking um, Assassin Nanny episode. Dun, 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 which ends up being... It's like um, critical to later seasons. It's such a cool fucking music and beautiful, beautiful. It's so James Bondy. Also, oh, true, so true. Um, the Order of the Triad comes into the office and into the kitchen, rather, where Rusty's eating a sandwich. They have Dean and Hank, and they're like, "We believe that they got. We found our arch enemy and a guy named Torrid. He kidnapped my daughter to the Torrid Zone, and <laughs> Alchemist Torrid Zone. So butch." And Dean, they explain that Dean figured that out and that the Torrid Zone's a place between the, the Tropic of Capricorn and the Tropic of Cancer. I own an island there, Orpheus says. Which, whoa, damn, Orpheus, how rich are you? What the fuck? Just randomly owning an island in the ocean. But that apparently, or, uh, that's where Triana is. Which I want to say something real quick. Torrid has that level of magical ability. He could teleport her there. Also, did Tor do his research on Orpheus before he came to the Arch? Which would make sense to do, like, before an interview. But still, that's just impressive. And even so, isn't that, if I understand, the Tropic of Capricorn and, Can and Cancer is, like, where those two places meet is fucking far. Really far. So, that's a hella teleport. It's kind of interesting to think about. And then, as it's kind of, it's funny, Dean starts thinking about Triana in a bikini. And I'm assuming he gets a boner up on, because he's on uh, Jefferson Twilight's shoulders. And Jefferson is like, what, what, get off of me. <laughs> ah, well, boys, especially boys who don't understand sexual love or desire in any way, lust in any way. And then the alchemist, who, by the way, this whole time, Hank's been in a dress. And he grabs Rusty and is like, I just want to say, I want to thank you for accepting Hank for who he is. Which... True, Rusty wouldn't probably not care, but hilarious. <laughs> and then, freaking, they're like, let's show Dr. Venture our thing. And they grab their arms together, and they're like, order of the triad, assemble, and show off their cool-ass symbol. And then Rusty's like, get out of my kitchen. Ah, Rusty, never giving a shit. And then after the outro, it's 24, is trying to hitchhike. And 21's like, come on, we can be Jet Boy and Jet Girl. Like, I don't hear you because I hate you. <laughs> and then he's getting a ride and it turns out to be the prostitute who sees that they're bonafide people and freaks out and drives away. And 24 is like, I can't believe that whore stole my stanza. I can't believe, and 21 is like, I can't believe that whore survived the lake of acid. Ah, so true. This episode is really good. I'm glad I got to talk about what I read in the book. It's very important to me to give you some information that Jackson Public and uh, Doc Hammer were trying to portray. It's also, I really love Torrid's a fun character. I think he's an interesting design and also a really, like, if he was a real villain and this was like an actual, like, superhero type of world, he would be a very major threat with his fire abilities. It's also cool to see the bureaucracy of the guild being at its finest. You got to see the line of different guild villains, which will all be more or less be utilized in one way or the other as the series progresses. You got to um, see the Guild of Calamitous Intense Bureaucracy at the beginning with the video, which has the Sovereign being shown, Ward and um, Watch and Ward, and a little information. I want to point out, Watch is the Dispatch Agent and Ward is the Communications Agent. I always forget that they're technically different titles. They have different ranks or different jobs, rather. And it's just interesting to think about. Um, and it's fun to see <laughs> Dean's naivety, Hank's, like, go-getter weirdness that he always has, Brock's James Bond love, of course, it's neat to see, and Rusty's weird jealousy, but also, I don't want to say he was not wrong about himself, because he is wrong about, you know, 
being great overall, but he wasn't wrong about how, you know, those villains will jump on this fucking walking eye if I just put it out there and start, you know, showing it off. Because, weirdly, villains are all about just grabbing some scientific object or fighting some random scientific object. But, in the end, that's a great episode. I... I don't know what to say, honestly. This is a really fun little episode. I like Lady O'Pierre showing Dr. Girlfriend a little bit of a little, little bit of environmental or a bit of to storytelling with that. Honestly, I should talk about the main characters of that were introduced. Jefferson, Twilight, and Alchemist. Jefferson, he's a fun character. I, I love the little um, backstory that we get from, of him as the series progresses. The more information that you get about him, the f is, it gives you a lot more context. The Alchemist is one of the best characters in the series, in my opinion. He is really fun, really well written, really an interesting, actually great character that I just cannot get any better of. Like, he's just so good. So good. And Dana Snyder is a great voice actor. I love Shake, I love this guy, and they're in next episode, in literally next episode, he plays a character that I will point out for you that's really fun. And Dana Snyder is amazing. 21 and 24 are also really fun in this episode. I don't know how to, like, I don't, I don't want to get too much into it, but they're... Showing that 21's trying to break off and get it become his own villain is a good foreshadowing of what he's going to consistently try to do for the next few seasons. And also showing that 24, being the older of the two people, is more convinced of Monarch's ruthlessness and that they don't have what Monarch has. And then the showing of what, what Monarch has is true evil -y, super crazy villain level ruthlessness that he just fucks with people. Also, good job on that whore getting away. Well, that's going to be it for now. Like, comment, and subscribe if you're on YouTube. Hit me up on other places if you want to. And for Sprout Podcast, I love Venture Brothers. Go Team Venture! Goodbye!